Welcome to Health and Harmony Beyond the Teeth, where we dive into all subjects that will help you become healthier and happier. As a dentist, I believe dentistry is more than just teeth. So I created this show to focus on overall health. We will hear from leading experts about eating better, exercising better, breathing better, and sleeping better. We want to help you create harmony in your life so you can live your life to the fullest. We want you to thrive. Hello, welcome to Health and Harmony Beyond the Teeth. I'm Dr. Hal Stewart, your host. And today we have part two of a four-part series with Dr. Stephen Lamberg. Dr. Lamberg is the author of this amazing book, Treat the Cause, Treat the Airway. And last week, Dr. Lamberg went over his uh, questionnaire, which helps identify if uh, you or if you're a patient or if you're a doctor and you're, you want to screen your patients, helps identify if they're at risk for sleep disorder breathing and um, the uh, comorbidities or complications that go along with that. So Dr. Lemberg is going to go a little bit further into his book uh, today. And so uh, Dr. Lemberg, we're very, very happy to have you. And Thanks, um, we're looking forward to hearing more about this uh, incredible Great condition that's affecting uh, our, our culture here and our, our, the health of our country. Thank you very much, Hal. Thanks for the introduction. And this is just going to be a continuation of last week, pretty much. We're going to talk about why the airway is so important and how you can recognize an airway problem just from the simple medical history. You don't have to ask a lot of questions. You can, don't even have to see the patient, really. You can just look at their medical history that they filled out before they came into your office and you can get an idea of who you wanna triage. So we left off after chapter four uh, with giving you the feeling that the medical history is really, really important. And that we ask a couple of questions in each specialty of medicine in order to find out if they have a problem in that particular system. Uh, and the notion is that that problem is caused by something that's going on, that chronic inflammation. And the chronic inflammation may be caused not by heredit, uh, you know, in, inheriting something. Uh, and, and it's really, you have to start thinking, where does it all start? What's the upstream problem that's causing all these medical conditions? So um, we're gonna start with chapter five today, neurology. And we ask four questions. And the four questions are, do you experience numbness, uh, tingling or pain in your feet or hands? Or head? Do you experience uh, leg cramps at night? Do you ever experience muscle weakness or dizziness or difficulty with coordination? Uh, have you ever been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia? So those are the four questions we ask in neurology to find out if they have an airway problem. So what do we know? Uh, these are the fast facts again. Neurologic disorders that are frequently improved by OSA treatment include dementia, stroke, epilepsy, and headaches. So we can treat the airway and we can find out that these disorders are improved. OSA is independently associated with a diabetic neuropathy. 60% of patients with diabetes and OSA also have peripheral neuropathy, which is partly reversible with OSA treatment. So that's proof right there that there's a connection. Peripheral neuropathy is correlated with a degree of hypoxemia in obstructive sleep apnea. And you should appreciate patients with neuromuscular disorders, 42% of OSA. Alzheimer's patients, the prevalence of sleep disorder breathing is 50 to 70%. Dementia patients, 75%. Parkinson's patients, 20 to 60%. Cluster headaches have been reduced by OSA treatment. You could take medicine until you're, you know, until you're dead and you're really not treating the problem. You're just treating a consequence of the problem. You're treating symptoms. 90% of restless leg syndrome patients have periodic leg movement disorder, PLMD, which further contributes to fragmented sleep. 50% of those with both epilepsy and some risk factors for OSA had OSA, and when treated with CPAP therapy, their seizure frequency was reduced by almost half. In adults, myasthenia gravis patients, 60% have OSA. So there's a number of pathways that we're gonna talk about just we're gonna talk about two important pathways today. So what is up with this peripheral nerve damage? Uh, and the reason for it is frequent drops in oxygen in the tissue. So you have chronic intermittent hypoxia in OSA 
It's an independent risk factor for damage of peripheral nerves because there's compromised oxygen due to peripheral blood vessels being constricted when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. All that blood is shunted to your muscles so you can be ready to beat up the monsters that are chasing you. So your fingers get cold. You know what happens when you have sympathetic activation. So sleep fragmentation uh, from arousals also activates the sympathetic nervous system and creates vasoconstriction as well. Also, nitric oxide is needed to relax those constricted vessels and allow oxygenated blood to flow to the periphery. And nitric oxide can be used up and less bioavailable during the obstructive breathing events. So the peripheral vessels may remain very constricted and it interrupts the crucial oxygen supply to these nerves, which causes the neuropathies. So it's the oxygen and sympathetic nerve, nervous system being activated. Another pathway causing neurologic disease is the fragmentation of sleep. Many patients with OSA have little or no slow wave sleep as a result of the frequent arousals. And as the brain tissue lacks lymphatics to drain intracellular waste products, it relies on a very unique system called the glymphatic system. And that's just in the brain. The, the glymphatic system is composed of spaces around the blood vessels that receive the waste products directly from the glial cells, the nerve cells in the brain. And this lymphatic system, unfortunately, only operates in slow wave sleep. So if fragmentation of the sleep causes a reduction in the slow wave sleep, N3, then those waste products, namely there's the beta amyloids and the tau proteins, they build up in the tissue. And because of the cellular garbage is never taken out, all those proteins build up in the brain and they are thought to be responsible for causing Alzheimer's disease. So diagnosing and treating a sleep breathing problem in these patients reduces the risk of their condition worsening. So if we have someone that's marginal or they're developing these neurologic problems, we wanna test them and get them help as soon as possible. Then we move on to the endocrinology section hormone messenger system. Have you been diagnosed with diabetes or hypothyroidism? Have you unexpectedly gained or lost weight lately? Have you gone through menopause? Are you on hormone replacement therapy? Have you been diagnosed with low testosterone? I have a lot of patients that come in, they say they have low T, never heard of that 10 years ago, and, and they're taking testosterone now. Do you experience repetitive limb movements or jerks in your sleep, urges to move your legs? night sweats or leg cramps. So let's see how this all works. Cause these are all your, this is your endocrine system here, the adrenal gland, the pituitary, pineal, the testicles, the ovary, the pancreas, the thyroid and the thymus. So this, this comprises the endocrine system. In the general population, 17% or 20% have OSA, but within these obese populations, up to 70% have OSA. Okay, let's look at the type two diabetes population. Type two, it's not uncommon to have someone with type 2 diabetes. Approximately 71% of OSA, we, we should test them. They get an overnight sleep study. Within the OSA population, 40% have diabetes. Nighttime hypoxemia, oxygen drops, has been independently associated with the development or worsening of impaired glycemic control. In other words, less than six hours of sleep increases the risk of prediabetes 4.7 times. So a lot of these people that are developing diabetes, they don't just automatically develop diabetes. Do you think 300 years ago, everybody had diabetes? No, people aren't sleeping enough. HPA axis was activated by OSA and the associated increased nocturnal cortisol levels that were found were reduced with effective OSA therapy. In the OSA population, 60% have metabolic syndrome. And when it occurs with OSA, that's syndrome Z. In population, OSA population, osteoporosis was almost three times greater. 75% of women with gestational diabetes had OSA. Okay, there was an association of gestational OSA and preterm birth. And another time how I think we, we can delve into that. We have a little bit of a chapter on uh, obstetrics later, but I would love to spend a half an hour with you talking about that whole thing with sleep-related breathing disorders in pregnant women at another lecture. That would be, it's a great topic uh, and there's some good research on that right now, today. So sleep duration and quality are predictors of increased HDA1C and in hypothyroid patients, 30% have OSA 
and responded well to thyroxine replacement therapy. Patients with nocturnal sweating were three times more likely to have OSA. So, you know, you're going to test these people. 80% of patients with restless leg syndrome have these, that's periodic leg, leg movement. Uh, it's associated medical conditions include uremia, diabetes, iron deficiency, and OSA. So if they have 80% of the patients that have restless leg syndrome have periodic leg movements. Periodic leg movements happen at night. Restless uh, leg syndrome is something people shake their legs during the day. They feel like a creepy feeling in their leg. But a lot of those patients are going to have very strange things called PLMD, periodic leg movements at night, and that also can fragment sleep. Uh, we should also appreciate testosterone levels are lower in men with OSA, and 35% of women with PCOS had OSA, so you have to test them. Now, how does this work? Why are those facts those facts? Well, the pathophysiology is this. During sleep fragmentation from OSA, hormones such as cortisol and insulin, which regulate metabolism, are elevated, and they can lead to diabetes and weight gain. So hormones that affect the appetite, such as ghrelin and leptin, also can contribute to overeating. So ghrelin production signal, signals hunger that's elevated, Leptin production, which signals being full, is reduced because leptin is only made in slow wave sleep. And if you have fragmented sleep, you don't have leptin. So you don't have the signal for being full. Many people who have OSA, they have a, re a reduced slow wave sleep and as a result of those arousals. Additionally, the weight gain can further exacerbate, be, uh, further exacerbate by typical excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, EDS, associated with OSA, which leads to lethargy and a lack of interest in doing anything. They're just tired. So sleep loss and decreased sleep quality, sleep frag, even without the presence of OSA is associated with obesity, impaired glucose regulation, and reduction in insulin sensitivity, even though plenty of insulin is being produced. So these catecholamines change how the bodies actually use the insulin, increasing the need for insulin. And that's called insulin resistance. You can't make enough. Put stress on the beta cells in the pancreas, uh, in the islands of Langerhans, that's where insulin is produced. Eventually, these cells become unable to produce more insulin, and this progression of events leads to type 2 diabetes. Testosterone is another hormone affected by OSA as a result of two pathways. First, testosterone production is associated with a hypothalamic pituitary gonadal function, and studies reveal that OSA causes a decrease in HPG function and treatment of OSA improves that function and sexual function. And patients with low T should consider having an overnight sleep study to evaluate if they have obstructive events. Secondly, testosterone is made, guess when? In slow wave sleep. So if you have fragmented sleep, your blood levels of testosterone are probably reduced because of a selective reduction of slow wave sleep because of sleep fragmentation. So there's a number of reasons here that the whole endocrine thing is uh, problematic because of fragmented sleep. So perhaps one of my favorite chapters is otolaryngology. And this is your ENT that we send almost 80, 70 or 80% of our patients go see an ENT. Do you have difficulty breathing through your nose? Do you have experience? Uh, do you have a dry mouth upon awakening? Do you have allergies that make nasal breathing difficult? Is a post-nasal drip a frequent problem? Well, the nose has several functions. It filters allergens, it humidifies the inhaled air, and it warms the inhaled air and increases the availability of nitric oxide because nitric oxide is made in the four sets of paranasal sinuses. And you really, you need that. If you don't have nitric oxide, you're not going to be able to open up the blood vessels after they're constricted from a sympathetic nervous system event. So there's a lot of functions. It's also antimicrobial. It prevents platelets from sticking together. So it reduces the risk of heart attacks and stroke as well. So reduced nasal breathing is a big problem. It leads to the mouth breathing and hence the question, do you have a dry mouth when you wake up? And a lowered tongue posture, if you're having a growing kid with a low tongue posture, you should understand or appreciate that the, the whole arches, the upper arch of teeth and the maxilla is formed by the tongue being up and forward. And if you're breathing through your mouth, then the tongue drops down and you end up with a very narrow arch. And remember the roof of the mouth is the same as the floor of the nose. So a very, very narrow 
nose. And if you have a narrow passageway through your nose, it's really, it reduces the airflow by a cube, by Pasolt's law. So looking over here, you can get enlarged adenoids, which could be a problem. You can have uh, frequent respiratory infections, which is also, if you have nitric oxide, you can reduce this because it's antimicrobial. You can have swollen nasal mucosa, you can have nasal septal deviation, a contracted maxillary arch, decreased nasal width. This can lead to reduced nasal breathing. When you do your exam, you're gonna start looking at all these things. Um, mouth breathing leads to extended head posture. You know those kids you see sometimes and their, their head is way forward and it takes a lot of effort to, uh, to hold that whole watermelon in front of your shoulders. You, you really sh everybody should stand up straight like a yogi. And that whole watermelon on top of your shoulders should go right down your spine. And then you won't have to see a chiropractor. So these things feed off on each other and it just gets worse and worse. And here's a couple of pictures. This is a very narrow palate and it's high arch. When you see something like this, you should think low tongue posture. The tongue wasn't up there. And you can see that uh, this is a retronathic person over here. The maxilla and the mandible are back. These are problems with the nose and this is an external uh, nasal valve here, which is very narrow on the right side compared to his left side. And bone, this grafts, different types of uh, batten grafts that can be placed here by the ENT. They can also take a, an enlarged turbinate, which is blocking the air, and they can reduce the size of that turbinate. Don't cut it out. We don't remove them anymore. That had been done. Um, but now they're just reduced in size to allow the nasal airflow, appropriate nasal airflow. And here's a, an example of septoplasty, which straightens out from the left side to the right side, the septum. And that allows the air to flow a little bit more smoothly through the uh, nasal passageways. This was an experiment that was done by Harwell, and you couldn't do this today, but he found by, he took plugs and put them in the monkey's nose. And look what happened. Look at that narrow, long, skinny face. Well, the good news is after he found that this monkey had a long, narrow face, but the unplugged monkeys didn't, he then took these corks out of the nose and then the monkey went on to grow up to be a normal monkey. But this is a, this just shows that when there's mouth breathing and the tongue drops down, that's the scalpel for the upper arch. And we see this in, in our patients. And then we see arches like this. And it's my belief that if we had a more aware population and we made sure people were nasal breathing, that we wouldn't need orthodontics at all. Because if we look at indigenous cultures and pre-industrial cultures, we find by and large, they're there, there are no orthodontic needs because their tongue is up because they're breathing through their nose. And there's a lot of reasons why we're not breathing through our nose. There's allergies. Well, why do we have allergies? Perhaps we're inside too much. Uh, perhaps we, the foods that we eat are too soft, so we don't have a lot of muscular activity. And that contributes to this as well because a lot of the bones are formed by mechanotransduction. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why, uh, like the Eskimo kids, they're given whale blubber and they're supposed to chew on whale blubber when they're little kids. So in our culture right now, there's no nothing like that. They, they're fed soft food so they don't choke for years, for the first couple of years. Look at this kid at age 10. He looks perfectly normal at age 10. And then must have been an allergy has developed and he's now his mouth breathing and look what's happening to his chin. This is the same child at age 10 and age 17. He's gone through a growth spurt, but during that period when he had the growth spurt, he had some allergies or for whatever reason, he was breathing through his mouth. And then look at the chin over there. And this is horrifying and it doesn't have to be. Now that he's a candidate now for a, a maximum mandibular advancement and that's a big surgery and he'll look fine, but that's a lot of work to do. And it was all avoidable because he started right here this wasn't a genetic thing at all. It was a behavioral mode of breathing that caused this problem. We know that your nose accounts for 50% of your total upper airway resistance. Total upper airway resistance, all right? It's your nose. So we, we we're really super involved with ENTs. Physiologic functions, we already went over. 40% of today's population have chronic nasal obstruction. 
I think it's probably closer to half. Both CPAP and oral appliances are more successful when nasal airflow is optimized. So why not send every single patient uh, to have a nasal evaluation? Nasal surgery reduced obstructive sleep apnea severity by 50, in 56% of the subjects. Nasal congestion patients are twice more likely to have OSA, so we test them. Nasal congestion is independently associated with snoring frequency, and patients with self-reported nocturnal nasal obstruction are three times more likely to snore and suffer from daytime somnolence. Nasal inflammation and sinus problems can result from OSA and can make OSA worse. Allergic rhinitis increases the risk of asthma by threefold. So the Chinese had a phrase for the breath inhaled through the mouth, ni qi, and it stands for adverse breath. And this is thousands of years ago they knew about this. I don't know how they intuited this, but just as a point of interest, the right nostril, more sympathetic gas pedal feeds more O2 to the left hemisphere of the brain. Fight or flight circulation speeds up, body gets hotter, cortisol levels increase, heart rate and blood pressure increase. The left nostril is more parasympathetic. It slows things down, feeds more oxygen to the right side prefrontal cortex for creative thought and emotions, informations of mental abstractions and negative emotions. So if you've ever been to a yoga breathing class, I've experimented with that. They hold one nostril, you breathe in, and then you hold your breath and you exhale, and then you breathe in through the other nostril. And so you can experiment. Uh, doing these. And as a matter of fact, James Nestor, who recently spoke at our network uh, for us uh, two weeks ago on May 11th at the uh, PANI meeting, uh, he wrote the book Breath, and I'd really, really, really recommend that uh, that book. He taped his nostrils up for two weeks. He couldn't stand it. His blood pressure was through the roof, and he was miserable as could be. And so he proved to himself uh, through doing these experiments how important it is to nasal breathe. So let's take a peek at urology, and then we get to dentistry after this, which is really fun. So urology is, uh, the questions I ask for urology, do you experience erectile dysfunction? Uh, most of the women say no. Uh, do you experience decreased interest in sex, or have you taken medications to enhance sexual performance? Do you ever leak urine involuntarily, or do you have to urinate several times at night, or have you been diagnosed with BPH? And you'll know what the urinary system is. Everybody knows that. OSA is associated with increased prevalence of overactive bladder. Within the OSA population, 40 to 64% have erectile dysfunction. Within the erectile dysfunction population, 40 to 40% have OSA. So a sleep study is indicated for patients diagnosed with ED. So if you know any urologists, and they're giving out pills for ED, you should suggest to them that they might consider having a sleep study done and that you'll do sleep studies for any of their patients that have ED. And that might be a way non-pharmacologically to approach that. So sleep fragmentation, sympathetic activation from OSA causes a decrease in circulating ADH. It's anti-diuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, which is a major cause for ne needing to urinate at night. Also ANP, to decrease blood pressure causes the need to urinate. And we're gonna talk about that on the next slide. OSA should be considered whenever a patient reports frequent nighttime awakenings to urinate, okay? There's a couple of reasons and we're gonna delve into that. OSA patients report snoring and nocturia equally, approximately 82% of the time, and studies show them to be equivalent at screening for OSA. So if people get up three or four times a night to pee, they're not supposed to do that. And that's an indication that they have a couple of things going on and we can tie that back, the smoking gun, we can tie that back to OSA. OSA population with CPAP treatment had two thirds reduction in urina urination events. OSA patients age 51 and 65 had a six fold increase in BPH compared with the patients without OSA. Therefore, BPH patients should be referred for a sleep study instead of giving medications, or they can get medications secondarily. 25% of patients with chronic kidney disease had OSA. Okay, so let's tie this all together here. There's a lot of stuff on that last slide. 
So OSA and enlarged prostate can lead to the need to urinate and empty the bladder at night can interfere with sleep. So that diagnosis can be missed. In OSA, you have sleep fragmentation. There will usually be a reduction in REM and or slow wave sleep. This hormone vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone supposed to, it's supposed to stop you from peeing at night is made just during slow wave sleep. And it's the function of it is to stop urinating at night so you can sleep all night. So it's a healthy physiologic function. But if you have reduced slow wave sleep or no slow wave sleep, you get less ADH. Additionally, there's this other peptide called ANP, and that's in your atria. There's stretch receptors, and the stretch receptors release ANP and sends it a message to the kidneys, and it says, we have high blood pressure. We want you to decrease the blood volume. So why don't you release some urine so the blood pressure goes down? And that's what AMP does. So you have the AMP working and you have a decrease in the vasopressin and you have two of those things, it's the perfect storm. So because OSA causes a decrease in ADH and increase in AMP, together they create this great storm leading to frequent nighttime awakenings to urinate. And overnight sleep studies should be done to evaluate the presence of OSA when this red flag presents itself. So I'm assuming most of the people on this, seeing this podcast are dentists or in the dental community. So this is really a great one because you can go right past the whole medical history. If you're in a, having a busy day and someone sits down in front of you, you can just look right in their mouth and you can see all these red flags that relate to airway. Do you grind your teeth while sleeping? Do your front teeth have a worn look? Have you had jaw muscles? Do you have jaw muscles or joint pain or ringing in your ears or vertigo or dizziness? Have you been diagnosed with periodontitis? Are your teeth crowded or crooked or are your jaws misaligned? Okay, these, those are the questions we ask in the questionnaire and these are the fast facts. Sleep bruxism is reported in 8% of the general population versus 25% in the OSA population. OSA patients have about three-fold increased risk for sleep bruxism. Within the sleep bruxism population, the prevalence of OSA is fourfold that of the general population. So if you have bruxers, if you have clenchers, if you have people that say, the muscle hurts here, test them. And if the muscle hurts there and they're clenching or grinding, what do you think is happening in the joint? Clicking and popping maybe. The pterygoids are hyperactive. There's always increase in sympathetic nervous system about four minutes prior to sleep bruxing. We know that. So there's a lot of misunderstood things with sleep bruxism. Um, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's not an airway event because we have these people that don't have sleep apnea and, and they brux. Well, they might not have sleep apnea, but they might have inspiratory flow limitation, which is less than that. They might have a sleep study that doesn't show that they're having apneas and hypopneas, but they might be having inspiratory flow limitation. And if that turns on the sympathetic nervous system, guess what? You're gonna have this activity to try to restore the airway. And indeed, we, we do know that in all cases of bruxism, there's a sympathetic nervous system outflow four minutes prior to the event. So put two and two together. What is causing this? sympathetic nervous system and what's activating the sympathetic nervous system. It's up to you. You can choose. It could be airway. Maybe they're just having monkey brain or their, their life is falling apart. They had a recent divorce. They might have some external things going on, environmental things going on, but we can't, dis, we can't just discount or rule out airway, even if they have a negative PSG or overnight sleep study. So I would test all these people. I would be very careful about the fact that they could have an airway problem that's being missed in the normal PSG. The rhythmic mastering muscle activity, which is what it's called, occurs in association with sleep arousals and sometimes without arousal, sometimes without O2 desats. The IFL causes the pressure changes in the esophagus leading to the sympathetic nervous system activation. So children with bruxism are three times more likely to present with TMD and in OSA population, 52% have TMD. In TMD population, 65% reported sleep bruxism. 
In the TMD population, one third have OSA, so TMD patients should all be tested. In TMD population, 42% have tinnitus and 18% dizziness, so sleep test them. And I had a TMJ consult come in today, and this poor kid, he's, he, he pointed to he, here, and this is not the TMD. No, this is not the TM joint. This is the masseter muscle. It, it ends up the kid had external nasal valves like this, and it was very nasally. And the mother said he does snore. And we ended up taking comb beam on him. He has a deviated septum, a small external nasal valve. And he did have a little click in one of the joints. And all this stuff, it was a 20-year-old kid. All this stuff's related to airway, I believe. And we sent him for evaluation just this afternoon to see his ENT. I gave him his comb beam on a thumb drive so he can share all that information uh, with the uh, otolaryngologist who's a surgeon. Again, this is what happens. Narrow, what do we do when we see these narrow people? Sometimes we put crowns or veneers and make their smiles look bigger, right? And uh, that's really not the thing to do. We, we have to find out if they have an airway problem. So airway focused dentists understand that crooked teeth are merely a symptom of an airway problem, which must be addressed. Crooked teeth, narrow arches, they're the canaries or red flags signaling us about the presence of a low tongue posture and the increased risk of having an airway problem. All of these patients should be evaluated for sleep-related breathing disorder. Low tongue posture can also be caused when the lingual frenum is very tight and restricts the tongue from moving forward and up. So I would suggest that we do tongue range of motion evaluation and collect that data when we do our initial exam. The point of this particular slide is not to make you dizzy. The point is to show you that we have blood pressure level baroreceptors in the carotid sinus, O2 chemoreceptors in the carotid body. We have in the epiglottis and the thoracoabdominal viscera, baro and chemoreceptors in the aortic arch and the aortic bodies. We have all this stuff coming, we have the nasal cavity, the soft palate, the lower esophagus has receptors and all of these afferents, sensory afferent nerve system, is sending these messages that something's going on. There's a sympathetic activation going on. And it goes up the tractus salteris, the solitary nucleus, the reticular formation, and the cort you get a cortical arousal. And then the sympathetic nervous system is upset and upregulated. But guess what else can happen? It can stop at the solitary nucleus and go through the limbic pathway and still go down this, this way to activate the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal glands and release cortisol. So you don't have to have an arousal in order to have sympathetic upregulation. And that's the point of the slide, nothing more. We're not having a, a test later on on the neurology. It's just an interesting way. I wanted to graphically show you that you don't need to have a cortical arousal in an event, you can just have an inspiratory flow limitation that can turn on these sensory afferents, which can go up and before you have a cortical arousal, it can still activate everything. If you're interested, you can pick up this Lamberg questionnaire, version 15 at drlamberg.com. Again, you can call my office, ask for Melissa. She can fax it to you or email it to you. And thank you very much for your attention. And this is the end of part two. Thank you, Dr. Lamberg. Again, Dr. Lamberg's book, Treat the Calls, Treat the Airway, uh, an excellent book. You know, when you were talking, Dr. Lamberg, uh, there's, uh, I took so many mental notes that I wanted to comment upon, but we would still be in part one <laughs> had I done that. But just a couple of my, my thoughts. You know, you were talking about testosterone when you're talking about the endocrine system. I don't know about in your area, but I listen to uh, local sports radio and every commercial break, there's an advertisement mm -hmm. for a tea center or they all have right. these, you know, quippy, cute names to them. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's our society, that's capitalism. You're taking advantage of, uh, of, a, of a deficiency and you're offering a solution, but the solution in this case is a Band-Aid um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's other things that might cause a low testosterone, but man, start with the root cause, start with, with, with sleeping and breathing. And then you talked about, um, you know, the, the, the little, the young man you saw today, 
with the, the pain in his muscles. How many dentists or even um, ENTs that do this might this person gone to and ended up with Botox injections in mm -hmm. his masseter muscles to relax the muscles when the cause is something, you know, up here above in the nose. And it, you, folks and, and doctors listening to this, when you start going down this rabbit hole, you start seeing health in a totally different way. And you start looking, you, you, you start going back when you see these symptoms in your patients. And what could really be causing this? Instead of just wanting to jump in there and treat the pain right then, because that makes us feel good to make the pain go away, but for how long? So Dr. Lamberg, my hat's off to you and I can't wait uh, for next week. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. Uh, I'll ask you a question, Hal. So if that patient that came in with the pain in his muscle, I think a lot of dentists would have made a night guard. Don't you think? Yes. And where does the night guard go? In the mouth. <laughs> and, and there's a little competition for space up there, isn't there? Yes. The tongue. So that would actually encroach on the tongue and that might make the airway worse. Right. So you'd basically be protecting the teeth at the expense of even increasing the upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Right. Just a thought. Yeah. No, sometimes our, our cure is, is, I'm not going to say worse than the disease, <laughs> but it, it actually right. helps the disease move along. So uh, you're exactly right. Um, the tongue's fighting for space and anything we put in there is taking up that valuable space. So you, you did exactly what I would have done. Uh, you did the exact right thing. If, you know, he gets that treated and he's still having a, a, a pain there, then you can look at other things, but that's the right way to go. And, and, and I get my hats off to you and I'm looking forward to, uh, to next week. Uh, Dr. Lemberg will be going over the uh, the the first part of the last half of his book. So we've mm -hmm. we've uh, finished part one and two now. Next week will be part three. And Dr. Lemberg, we're looking forward to having you back. This has been Health and Harmony Beyond the Teeth with your host. I'm Dr. Hal Stewart. You guys have a great week. Uh, stay happy and stay healthy. God bless. <music>